All right, um, I'm going to get started. Hello, welcome everybody to our first video AMA. My name is Ugur, and I'm a business developer for API3. And today I will be moderating the AMA. Um, right off the bat, this is our first trial run of a video AMA. And if everything runs smoothly today, this is going to be the format going forward for our biweekly community calls. Um, you will be able to submit questions to us before every AMA and also ask questions during the live session of each of our AMAs. We will most likely also be extending the video format to other platforms like YouTube. And these sessions are also being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So uh, feel free to drop us any feedback for today's session into our Discord so we can keep improving on the format and make it better each and every single time. So with that out of the way, um, let's dive into today's session. We're going to start the session by working through some questions that were left over from our last MA before we dive into the live section of this AMA. Um, if you have any questions that you want to ask us today, please feel free to comment uh, under the Twitter uh, post, under the tweet. Uh, we have Mithav in the background who is going to be selecting from your questions. Um, only one thing to keep in mind is that we do not comment on prices, on exchanges, or any partnerships in the pipeline. So those questions uh, don't really get picked. So today we have Sasha, Burak, Mason, and Mark with us. As you know, Sasha is one of our co-founders. She has an academic background in computer science and statistics, and she's working on the technical side of things and is also starting to take a more of an active uh, community-facing role. We have also Burak here. Burak is another one of our co-founders. He has been doing research uh, in applied computer vision before focusing on API-centric Oracle solutions. Burak is the go-to person in regards to development at API3. We also have Mark here, uh, AKA The Voice. Mark has a background as a network engineer and project manager with a focus on code and blockchain project research. For API3, he deals with regulatory compliance, enterprise strategy, and our internal business infrastructure. And finally, uh, we have Mason, who has a background in business communications and has worked in the FinTech space. Mason is our business development lead and is heavily involved in our business operations as well as our strategic development. So um, I'm going to be diving right into uh, the remaining questions of our AMA from the last time. Uh, the qu first question being, um, what's the state of the project? And this question uh, goes to Burak. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so as always, I will first direct people towards our white paper and our medium post because I think they explain this uh, uh, at length in detail. Uh, but then, yeah, I, I will try to uh, do a quick summary of it. And also, like, I, I'd also suggest you to read the development updates because, like, we I think we only have three of them out right now. But as time goes on, you will be able to keep a closer track of the project. Uh, with those, because the white paper, although we are planning to update it regularly, it may not always be like super up to date, and the development updates will help you at least in regards to where the product is at. Um, yeah, so I think in general, API three has immense scope as a blockchain project. So not even as an Oracle project, but even among all blockchain projects, it has quite a large scope because it has a lot of different components on different. Uh, field. So, for example, there, there is the ARNR protocol and the DAPIs. So that is the on-chain component of API3, or at least its products. And then we have AR node, our Oracle node, that is designed to be operated by API providers. So that is the off-chain part of the product. And then we have an integration platform that will allow these API providers to operate their AR nodes. And then that, that can be considered as its web component. Um, and then we have quite a large, I think, business component. And like I, I, I'll not dive too much deep into it, but like it has multiple channels, uh, each like quite significant. And then yeah, Mason can talk more about that. And I think about all that, we also have the governance component, which is essentially the, the DAO. So 
if you think about existing blockchain projects, like they tend to focus on one of these things. Uh, meanwhile, we have like all of these and uh, development is going at a pretty good pace. So I sometimes personally get a bit frustrated about people asking when the product will be out because the answer is yes. I mean, th there is no single product. And I think one way to look at it is the DAO is the product is, I think, a good way to look at it because um, essentially API 3 is a DAO that is focused on integrating APIs to smart contract platforms. So, and then all of these products that I have listed just now, it, it is its products. So, but then it, they are minor compared to the DAO itself. So, um, yeah, I, I'd say in general, the product itself is the DAO, but then it creates a lot of different Oracle solution products around it that are like connected to these API providers. Um, yeah, that's about it. So in general, we are pretty close to uh, releasing the authoritative DAO, which is uh, the version of the DAO that you will be able to stake. And I think there will be a question about that. So we can get into more detail uh, about it. But yeah, in general, we are very close to releasing the main product, but then we will have a lot of them like lined uh, and then be released over time. Thank you for that answer, uh, very elaborative. And um, if you guys have any questions that you wanna ask Burak, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of the stream, just comment underneath. We have uh, Mithav in the background, picking questions and uh, making them ready for the live AMA section. The second question uh, goes to Mason. Um, how do you attract API providers and are there any uh, marketing efforts in regards to that? Stage is yours. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to, to answer kind of the first part of the question, how do we attract API providers? I'm a firm believer that in this industry, you know, so far it's kind of been like this echo chamber where you either get blockchain or you don't. And, um, you know, unfortunately that's kind of to the chagrin of, of just mainstream adoption in general. Um, so our approach, in in the business development team uh, for API providers is not to get too hung up on on blockchain technology in general, but to really kind of come at it from an angle of um, you know you're opening up your market to a whole new customer, right? Um, what we're we're really offering here is AirNode. AirNode uh, basically allows them to to connect um, and and serve their products and services to blockchain based businesses, right? So um, they have a vested interest in just getting involved because it's a hot market. And, um, you know, a lot of people want data. So when they realize that we're not really selling anything, but we're offering kind of like a partnership, um, where, you know, they kind of help us build this uh, robust ecosystem of data endpoints. Uh, we get a lot of excitement. People are very uh, open to that. Um, you know, they, they don't really necessarily need to understand what's underneath the hood, uh, so to speak, with blockchain technology to understand the value add and also that it's just extremely, um, you know, it, it's kind of hitting this trajectory of, of uh, fever pitch right now, right? Um, in regards to the second second uh, question, like marketing efforts, there's there's a variety of things that we're doing. So. Um, you know, just for the business development team in general, we're focusing on digital ad spend and, and things that can kind of like generate some inbound leads. Um, but then, you know, in regards to um, more kind of long term strategic approaches to like marketing and branding, we are um, kind of doing a lot to to like convey, I think that uh, we really see ourselves as like standard bearers in this industry, right? Like we we want to um, have the ability to kind of like, you know, provide some thought leadership in regards to uh, just like why businesses should adopt this, right? Like what the real uh, benefit is in general across the board, no matter what industry you're in with uh, adopting, you know, this technology. And so there's a lot of different angles, I think, to, um, you know, a, a really successful marketing push where you're kind of like developing a narrative that that makes a lot of sense, you know what I mean? And really kind of resonates with people. Um, so 
outside of just the specifics of, you know, normal ad spend and stuff like that. I think that we're doing a lot specifically right now in kind of cultivating this, this long-term vision of how we view ourselves. Um, and it, it works really well, you know, specifically because um, in the white paper, the, the narrative and the tone and uh, the vision is very clearly uh, laid out. And so we're aligning ourselves and everything that we do in that, um, in that way, right? And I think that it, it's kind of a natural, easy, organic process of really like aligning to this idea of just making the space better um, and, and really kind of carving out the path uh, you know, and, and also solving the API connectivity problem. Perfect. Thank you for the answer, Mason. Um, again, uh, I want to welcome, uh, every single newcomer. Um, if you have any questions that you want us to answer in the live AMA section, please feel free to comment. Uh, we will be gathering those and answering you, uh, later in the second part of the AMA. So the next question goes to Sa uh, Sasha. And uh, it is uh, regard in regards to the development process. If you could elaborate more in regards to development process of API three. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, Uger. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, I guess I could get into a lot of detail about this, but I'll keep this relatively short. Uh, so I think the most important thing to know is that we work with. Uh, there's a core dev team, and then we also work with multiple external teams. So for example, uh, DXDAO uh, wrote a lot of our uh, initial uh, DAO contracts, and then we're also starting to work with Curve Labs now. So that's the first thing I kind of want to let people know that, that some of the contracts, especially the ones dealing with the DAO, um, we, we have like external teams work on that, and then there's certain things that we work on internally. So in terms of the core dev team, the way that we've sort of delineated the work, it makes us, it allows us to work quite independently, or at least that's been my experience. Like most of the things I've worked on, I've worked on quite independently because that's just been the, um, the, the way the work's been structured. And then obviously we loop each other into code reviews or, you know, if we, if we get stuck on something, we, we do very kind of casual meetings or discussions on Slack. And that's worked really well so far. And in terms of like uh, regular communication, we have a weekly stand up. We do daily updates, which are just like bullet points. What did you do today? Um, so so when we know what everyone's doing. When the team uh, grows even more, I think maybe we might have to change some of these things. But so far, it's worked quite well. Uh, and then in terms of the design process, like high level architecture stuff, most of that comes uh, most of that comes from Burak or is initiated by Burak, but he's pretty uh, he's pretty open about his process. So like he'll have an initial idea and ask for feedback and um, that, that, that that goes for a lot of the, the design and architecture stuff. It's like um, a lot of it's initiated by Burak, but then there's a lot of feedback from the rest of the team. Um, those were the main things. I feel like I can, I can get into really boring details about the development process, but I feel like those are some maybe interesting highlights for whoever asked that question. Maybe Borak wants to add something to that. Is there anything particularly interesting about our development process that I might have missed? Um, I mean, I think in general it is um, due to the fact that our like technical solutions are extremely tightly coupled to our business development, or at least how we are planning to approach business development. So when we are thinking about, um, for example, how the node is going to be deployed, and then the questions are not like very technical, but rather would an API provider be able to actually do this? And then the answer to that question is not, like it doesn't depend on some technical knowledge, but rather your knowledge of API providers and what they're capable of. So I think, yeah, in general, and I think I also um, mentioned this in the development update, the most recent one, like pretty much nothing is entirely technical about what we do. So it always has a very deep, I think, business or real world component. Uh, and then that requires you to get a lot of, um, I guess, insights from the other team members because like there's always something that you yourself cannot see. Perfect. Thank 
both of you for uh, those answers. I'm going to be jumping right into the second question or the next question, and that would be uh, for Mason again. Um, how many business developers do you have, and what is the job like? Yeah, definitely. Um, so right now, my team is eight people. Um, you know, we are aggressively hiring, so consistently um, looking for you know perfect matches uh, for this thing. Um, so feel free to to reach out if you're you're interested. Um, the job I think is you know is really flexible flexible in general. Um, my kind of approach to leading a team is more like giving people uh, you know the respect and empowerment that they deserve, um, and and really just selling them on the vision. Because if you're sold on the vision, you go out and you're hungry. You make this happen. You know what I mean? And um, so that is, I, I think that kind of bleeds into what the job is like. I mean, in, in general, when you're looking at business development, specifically outreach and sales and stuff like that, it can be a grind. Um, a lot of what I do is based on supporting people and making their lives a little bit easier um, while they go and, and do what you know is, is arguably one of the most important things that we're doing right now. Um, you know, so this is, um, it, it's, it's just basically one of those things where I don't want it to feel like a job. I want it to feel like we're changing the world because honestly, that's where our, our hearts and minds are, um, here on, on these teams in, in this organization. Um, so I hope that answers the question. It's a little more like ideological than fact-based, but it's the truth, right? Like, um, the job is really less of a job and more of like a mission and i'm you know i'm kind of steering uh, my team to think about it that way um because i think that that really yields better results in general and it's been working great so perfect thank you for that answer um just going to repeat again uh, if you guys have any questions that you want uh, us to answer in the live section feel free to uh, comment underneath and we'll be answering your guys shortly after we're done with the remaining questions that we already had so the next question goes to barack and i feel like that's something that's going to be very uh, interesting um how does staking work can you give us a rundown yeah i, I think we should just have a call about the dao and staking like it, it would make a whole call, I think. Uh, and then I, I also promised some posts back in the day that uh, I'm, I'm still planning to write those before the DAO is out. And yeah, we, we, I have been writing about the DAO development and stuff, but essentially that also means staking, right? So DAO and staking are a bit interchangeable. And that is because like, that is one of the utilities of staking. So when you think about it, the token has utilities but staking also should have some utility. So for example, there are some projects out there where you can stake the token and then it generates more tokens and then you get paid those tokens, but it's not really for like, the project itself doesn't get anything in return. So it is, I don't know, maybe like a speculative thing or some sort of novelty. But in this case, one of the main utilities of staking is to decentralize governance. So to be able to decentralize governance, you need people to participate in governance. So you need to somehow incentivize them, but then you should also keep them accountable to their decisions because if they govern incorrectly, then they should be penalized somehow. And then um, the, the only way of like providing it, the incentive is, or at least the most, uh, or at least the purest way of doing that is financial incentivization. And then the opposite of disincentivization again should be financial. Uh, and then essentially staking is there to implement that. Um, so what I mean by that is staking rewards are being paid out in return for governing the project correctly. So for example, if you're paying some percentage of APY, then that is the cost of decentralized governance because decentralized governance, like it, it shouldn't be uh, accounted for. It, it is like something very difficult to implement, right? Uh, and then it also comes at a cost because uh, in most cases, doing something, something in a centralized way is more efficient. It will cost you less, but it will break. And when it breaks, it will be catastrophic. That is the problem of centralization. And when you decentralize it, 
it will come at a cost. And in this case, that cost is the staking rewards. But I mean, fortunately for the stakers, that is <laughs> that's not a cost for them. It is actually being paid off to them. Um, and then how staking works is we have this staking target at the DAO pool, uh, which says that I want this percentage of the total token supply staked in the DAO pool. And why it says this is, uh, so we, we want decentralized governance to be participated in, and we need it to be participated in at a certain ratio, or at least more than a certain ratio. So for example, if we have 100% of the supply in circulation, and then only 10% of it is staked and is governing the project, then that doesn't make any sense because that 10% will be able to make all the decisions about all the like what the project is going to be doing. So it is 10% governing over 100%. So the the target stake should be around 50% or at least a lot larger than 10%. So, but then the problem is you cannot get a lot of people to stake. So you need to provide some kind of incentive which is where the staking rewards come in. So staking rewards are, they essentially float according to what the stake is and what the target is in a way that if not enough people are staking, so for example, let's say they are providing liquidity, they are staking on some other uh, protocol or like anything that you can think of, and they're not participating in governance. So what the DAO does automatically is it increases the staking rewards so that now some of those people will withdraw their tokens from wherever they are and then stake it at the DAO and then the stake uh, amount comes closer to the target and now staking rewards uh, increases a bit more slowly. And then as this happens, more people will stake and then at some point we may exceed staking target. And at that point, now the staking rewards starts um, decreasing because like, more people are staking than we need. And as I said before, the staking rewards, actually, they are a cost. Like you don't want to emit more tokens than you need to. And then you need to be emitting these tokens minimally. Um, and then that is, again, in a, like a, in a way that I have like explained, like as it goes up, if it is more than needed, then the rewards go down. And then it comes at an equilibrium just exactly at the staking target. So we are pretty excited about like seeing how this is going to work out. Uh, and then like th this is in general how the mechanism is, I think engineered is very similar to how EIP 1559 is like is going to be uh, implemented. So I think it is like pretty in line with the, uh, I, I guess that guy. So, so yeah. If you have any more questions about staking, I I'd be happy to like answer those more specific ones. But yeah, as I said, like there there are a lot to say about it, and I'm sure that I didn't like touch a lot of stuff that you are like uh, I don't know interested about. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. Um, I've also been told um, you don't have to only like comment under uh, the tweet. You can also write in Telegram uh, or Discord or comment right into the live stream. Metav is uh, monitoring all of those channels. So if you have any questions, just feel free to shoot in all of those directions. And uh, I'm going to be going to the next question. Um, this is going to be for uh, Mason and Mark. Um, it is uh, in regards to, are there even any use cases for APIs besides the typical ones like financial asset, uh, asset like financial or asset data APIs? And um, maybe we start with uh, Mark on that one. That's a good question, but it's kind of it's kind of pre-framed in the context of crypto up to now because I think the the main reason most of the API, you know, slash Oracle based data that's supplied is based on the fact that it's an extremely young technology, an extremely young field, and most of the background since 2016 has been speculative rather than adoptive for actual real world use. Um, to answer, yes, there are lots of different APIs, because if you look on Web2, virtually everything you see in the world is delivered by APIs, goods, supply chain, everything 
their internal and external or extranet systems within the corporate and legacy world. Now, the reason we don't see more is yet is because it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Um, how do I put it? Um, why don't we see more different types of APIs? It's because there aren't any applications. Why aren't there any applications for them? You know, blockchain applications is because there's not enough variety and richness of data. Um, but historically, if you provide the availability and the variety of the different kinds of data, for example, energy usage, utilities usage, um, supply chain, management in real time, shipping, um, I think I looked on LinkedIn months ago and there was an API Web 2 conference which was listing literally thousands of different kinds of APIs from any kind of real world business sector you could think of, enterprise or small to medium business. If the data is available, the projects will be built and the space will grow and the data will actually get used in addition to you know what we have now, which is a preponderance of speculative financial and asset-based streams because that's where the growth has been up to now. That is going to change as people use different types of data. But for the projects to be developed, I think you have to put, you know, the chicken first. You have to put the data out there. And that's the problem we seek to solve. Um, well put. It has more practical day-to-day -day things as to what kind of data feeds and opportunities he's encountering. <clears throat> yeah, Mason, go right ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I was fiddling with my mute. So, um, yeah, a lot of what Mark said, I, I think really resonates. Um, it, it is a very common question that we get uh, when we're talking to API providers, because, you know, if there is no, like, kind of um, example that they can wrap their mind around in regards to demands, then, you know, it can be kind of difficult um, to convey the value added to like connect to, to a blockchain, right? Um, however, I think it's actually a, a really simple thing to explain. Bottom line is, is that blockchain technology is like the latest, newest iteration of the internet, and it's just done totally differently. And it promises a lot of different benefits, okay? So even if you know nothing about blockchain, um, it's easy to kind of understand that, uh, you know, there's a lot of innovation that comes from this kind of new technology. Um, and that is really spurred by access to, to data, really. Um, you know, if, if the data is there, new innovations will, will come about from that, right? Um, I think a big problem, especially though, that's called out a lot in the white paper, and, uh, you know, we've, we've been pretty uh, vocal about it, is that, you know, there, there's been a lot of barriers to entry so far for off-chain businesses uh, to really get involved in this way. You know, you have to understand crypto uh, with a lot of other solutions. You have to like, you know, you have to um, essentially be involved um, a lot more than I think is normal in, in like the Web2 space, right? Plus, there's not really a um, level of security that is necessary on blockchain that really makes sense off chain um, as well. There are a variety of friction points in regards to like getting buy-in. So if I, if I don't understand that there is demand in this marketplace, I'm not gonna come out of pocket a bunch of money. I'm not gonna take a lot of risk, right? Like I'm not going to incorporate a lot of my infrastructure and hire, um, you know, maybe some blockchain developers and go about this huge push uh, to adopt blockchain if um, there is no indicator that there will be any kind of like, um, you know, demand, right? Like that my effort and money and, and all that is, you know, um, is going towards something that's meaningful and makes sense, right? And it's not just a waste. And so <clears throat> that's why AirNode is, is free and frictionless and very easy to, to operate with your normal API inf infrastructure. Um, because like, you know, there's no reason not to do it at that point. You know, if you if you run an air node at that point and there turns out to really not be that much demand, you don't lose anything. Um, and, and we are. All right, we apparently lost them. <laughs> um, I can expand a little bit. Basically, um, 
the objective to generate more types of data ties into the design of the air node. The ultimate objective is plug and play for web two. They can take, they can commission an AWS node, they can load an air node on it and it will run. Yeah, there is no requirement or little requirement compared to legacy previous iterations for blockchain experience, somebody to run a node. No, which is more, fits more within the comfort zone of a classic non-blockchain business. And that is that has been a barrier up to now, as Mason indicated. And that's something that needs to be fixed if the space is going to grow, as well as the variety of data. Perfect. Thank you for finishing that up. <laughs> the next one uh, is going to Sasha and is also going to be the final uh, question from the remaining uh, AMA. Um, how do you work so hard and deal with all of the negativity? Uh, that's a yeah, that's a fun question. Someone asked last time. We didn't have time to finish it. Um, I can't speak for everyone, but I know personally. So before I started working in crypto, I I guess I was a trader slash investor. Like I was familiar with crypto, and I was very familiar with the culture of um, I don't know what you'd call it, trolling and uh, fudding projects. Like I was pretty familiar with with that whole culture. So I was kind of prepared for the worst. Like I was expecting. Yeah, I was expecting much worse, especially after the first, when we launched our product, the first article, or I think it was the first article, um, used the term chain link killer. And we, that wasn't something that came from our end. That was like a reporter's uh, interpretation and it was their headline. So I was expecting like a barrage of, of negativity. And, and we, got a, we got a couple of things here and there, but honestly, it hasn't been as bad as I was, I was expecting and I was preparing for. And, and it's also a bit to do with my personality. Like I'm a very like glasses half full, see the bright side of things kind of person. So the, the nice things and, and the support from the community and from other people in the industry has meant so much more to me than like the couple of criticisms I see here and there. So um, yeah, I, I've, I've, it's, been, it's been an overall a good experience for me personally. Perfect. Thank you for elaborating on that. Yeah, um, that pretty much uh, completes uh, the remaining questions from the last AMA, and we'll be diving into uh, the live section now. So you have been asking us a lot of things, and um, I'm already sorry if we're not picking your question because there is, quite frankly, too much. Um, I'm going to be starting with the first one. Um, let's see here. So this one is um, from Ordulo36. So the staking target is connected to the quorum concept or are these two different and separately configurable parameters? And I suppose that it goes to Burak. Um, yeah, so more, more, these are more practical than, I think my answer was a bit too high level and I should have been more practical about it. Um, yeah, so the stake target and quorum, so by quorum, I think you mean like for people to understand, for example, how how much of a percentage of yes votes you need to be able to pass a proposal. So uh, for example, it could be 15%, 25%, 50%, that kind of thing. So is it related to stake target? So it is not directly related. It is, I think, conceptually related in that if you, for example, if your staking target is 50% and the total supply is 100 million, so that means that there will be 50 million tokens in the DAO uh, staked. And for example, if the quorum uh, that you need to reach is 50%, that means that to be able to pass a proposal, you need 12 and a half million API3 tokens. So the, essentially, if you increase the stake target, it is more difficult to or it's not more difficult, but you need more support in, ter in terms of number of tokens to pass proposals, but the two are not directly related. And I think th there was another question about staking. Uh, yes, uh, that ties into it. Um, same person, uh, please confirm um, auto compounding uh, feature of API3 staking, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I, I actually like solved this uh, question twice by like, someone else too. And it, it is pretty important. So 
Yeah, in general, I mentioned that some staking has utility and some staking doesn't. So our ours um, has two different utilities. So one is it is used to determine the voting power for governance. The other is it is used as collateral for insurance. So the thing is, when you have those, uh, it becomes a lot more difficult to implement all of that, plus make it user friendly in terms of the UX flow, and also make it uh, like uh, make the gas costs low. So I think like what we ended up with is I'm like pretty happy with it in that it is in fact very easy to use. It is very cheap to use. So when you stake once, you don't need to do anything again. So it has opt out. So you need to like decide when you need to unstake. So you can stake now, one year later, come back and unstake. So you don't need to do anything in between. Um, and then that the rewards that you get during that time will auto compound, meaning that so when you get some rewards from one week, you don't need to like log in or like connect your hardware wallet, stake again, etc. So none of that. And that is both a both a UX problem, but also like it will cost you gas, so you don't want to do that. And another thing with again UX and gas costs is sometimes people like some people may not have much to stake. So in terms of number of tokens, for example, say you have 0.001% of the total voting power. And then uh, like voting on mainnet will be expensive, whatever DAO framework you will use. And then you may not end up participating in governance. So that is not something that we want. So what we did is we implemented the uh, voting power delegation mechanic. So if you know someone within the community, within the DAO members or, or like whoever else that you believe that will be um, voting, will be able to vote on your behalf, then you can delegate your voting power to them. And then at no additional gas cost to you or to them, uh, they can use your voting power to vote. And then again, it is, so you state, you delegate your voting power to someone else and then you forget about it. You come back one year later. Hopefully, like all went well, and it, the DAO has been governed well. And then you can just unstake, get your rewards, etc. So I think it is uh, like it, it, it's going to be pretty great. Perfect. Um, thanks for that. Uh, we just have another one. I'm going to be reading out. Um, Having to run a blockchain node could scare away companies. How does API 3 approach this? And that is pretty much up to grabs for any one of you, I suppose. Um, Barack, if you want to. Otherwise, uh, Mason or Sasha or even Mark. Yeah, I think, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, it's my understanding that it's not required, right? So like, um, obviously it it is something that would probably make their processes smoother, but is not something that is required. So if somebody has like a hard, I, I don't wanna do that, um, that's okay. From what, I, from what I have gathered through some of our technical documentation, obviously, Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. I, I think in general, our approach is that like air node is not a blockchain node. It is an Oracle node. And an Oracle node should uh, be more like an API gateway than a blockchain node. So th th there's a whole medium article about that. But well, the, the essential idea is this. Like this is what we are arguing like in the whole white paper saying that companies will not be running blockchain nodes. So we should be building the sort of an Oracle node that companies would want to, or at least not mind running. So this is what AIR node is. Perfect, thanks for that. Um, the next one uh, is about what sort of use cases do you see in the near term? And um, that is again, a very open question. I'll keep it i'll give it to you guys for whoever wants to take it mark and it. mason 
Mark, you want to go first or do you want? I'll go on and you go. You have more. Um, I think one of the immediate use cases we will see is supply chain. <clears throat> because you need to verify inventory, real time, where it moves, when it moves, what it's doing. Is it on the shelves? Is it on the ship? Is it on the truck? Um, and that sector is absolutely immense. It totally dwarfs the speculative sector. And there's a huge need um, that has been addressed by some blockchain projects in the past. Um, I'm not sure how successfully. But the basic need for a supply chain is to immutably verify where anything is and what it's doing and you know what's being transacted and what's being moved at any particular point in time within the supply chain. And that has commonly been done with an enterprise and small to medium business with Web2 APIs. Um, so that sector is massive. It covers all industries pretty much. And that, I think, is a very strong use case that's going to come up next, although there are others, as Mason can tell you. Yeah, um, actually, it's funny. I was I was going to go for supply chain, but I, I have numerous ones back in like in my back pocket here. So, um, you know, I, I think that there is a lot of opportunity, you know, like specifically to um, uh, to like the insurance industry. Right. So like um, protection against insurance fraud um, or, you know, like look at something like weather data. Right. Like if you had weather data. Um, on the blockchain, you'd be able to kind of see specifically when a hurricane hit a specific location, right? And and all that would really take would be probably some uh, weather data and, and some geolocation data um, as well. So w one thing that I actually was just talking to a fellow colleague here about um, earlier today was was you know like if you're if you kind of consider that um, you know this is basically the new iteration of the internet like this is probably going to eventually take over um the internet in, in a lot of different ways um the the opportunities here are really endless like i could go on for days right um you know somebody in the chat is saying like medical data autonomous vehicles like think about you know a, a variety of ways in which um you know having an immutable ledger having the ability to trust that the data is in no way possibly um, able to be manipulated in any way. I think that's really powerful, right? Um, you know, I, I was talking the other day also about like the medical industry and how there's like a real, there's like a statistic um, of, of people who like die by accidental death in hospitals um, on a annual basis, right? And these are like uh, people who, uh, essentially it may have like a, a allergy or something. Um, and you know, the communication between, uh, different staffs of, of nurses and, and different, you know, specialists helping this person might get mixed up or, um, you know, whatever the case may be. And it's an inefficient process and that inefficiency is actually killing people. Right. So there's, there's a multitude of ways in which this, um, this technology really will revolutionize uh, things to the point, in my opinion, in like the extent to, of like even saving lives. Um, and, and really, I think the only limitation, which is really exciting for API 3, right, and what we're doing, like the, the, really the only limitation here on these kind of really awesome promising use cases is um, just accessing data. And I think that we're really solving that problem um, in, in the most um, efficient way possible. Can I add a little bit on the medical data? That's a very sure. good use case. However, and I do have a pre-chain blockchain background in this. One of the projects I worked on as a network engineer and project director was I was implementing the um, healthcare network for the whole of the UAE, which is called Wareed. It was about 81 sites we did. That included voice video data network, record keeping, and a complete Cerner medical suite of software and databases and a server. Um, server rack data center as well um now the thing with medical data iterations are so difficult is because the database doesn't update in real time synchronistically between the different sites so if patient a goes to clinic a and then goes to clinic f or something you have two different patient records for a different problem that's been a common iteration in many countries the blockchain could fix that and that's a very good use case but then <clears throat> 
you run into a compliance issue because <laughs> in terms of data regulation for compliance, you know, there is there are regimes in various different countries and global regimes for data protection. And it doesn't get more personal than your medical information. So something has to be developed to obscure that and yet identify it as a source of truth. When that's addressed, you will see medical data as a very strong use case, but not quite yet. Yeah, there's a little bit more building to come in other sectors yet. Perfect, thanks for that. Um, the next question is probably directed towards Sasha and also Burak, because they're mainly writing the articles. So are you also planning to translate all this technical theory into human language so even my parents will understand? Did you finish off the sentence or was it cut off? Uh, it was cut off, like it was the second comment afterwards. Okay. Um, what's funny is I feel like a lot of my articles, I feel like I do translate it, but I guess I have to translate it further. Um, so no immediate plans, but I have thought about uh, using a different medium. So for example, like YouTube and discussing the article topics, but maybe through like a conversation between me and one person or, or me presenting, but just the ideas from the blog posts um, simplified even further. Although I think the blog, po the blog posts are supposed to be a simplification of the white paper, but I suppose they could use a further simplification. Um, I feel like I was going to say something else and I don't remember. Borak, do you want to add something? I don't think that it's not like, it, it's not technically, I guess, difficult or complex, but rather it is like extremely integrated. Like there are a lot of moving parts uh, and that is what is making everything uh, complicated. But then that is the nature of things. I don't know. I mean, my parents understand. So. <laughs> Burak's parents are academics, though. Yeah, that's also true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, oh, someone, just... someone in the chat did mention that the video idea was good. And I, I just I think in general, it's good to kind of spread the message with different media across different media and also in a different format. I, I've just I've just seen it work elsewhere. So I think uh, I, I think we're due for some videos. Great. If, Thanks if, I, for that. if I can yeah, sure. also just add one last thing, sorry. Um, you know, I think another thing too is that this is something we're aware of, right? Like we we understand that there is like two different audiences. There's the highly technical who understand what we're doing and want to know the nitty gritty. And then there is the other side of it, which is like, what is the value add when I don't understand blockchain? Be like make it explain it to me like i'm five and so we are approaching in marketing efforts we're approaching this kind of um, uh, idea of just like conveying it in a really high level understandable way that makes a lot of sense and um, you know sasha i think has been a central force in that as well um you know so it's it's a great question but it's also one of those things that i think it's important that you know um you know it's known that like we are very interflected like uh inner reflective here on you know ways that we can improve and further add um you know some some information to um our community that makes a lot of sense for the average person and man i just all i can say is is i completely understand trying to convey this to your parents and them not getting it. So unlike Barack, my parents, I don't think still understand at all what I'm doing, so. Um, I also just wanna add something quickly, something that I've been thinking about a lot. And um, yeah, I'll try not to make this a rant, but I feel like too often we think about in terms of communicating blockchain ideas, like very binary, like people that are hardcore into blockchain and they get most of it. And then people that don't know anything, but that's actually not a good model. Like I, it, it's more, I, I see it more like concentric circles. Like there's people that are, even within blockchain, there's people that have various understandings. And then there's these, these people that are, uh, that do things that are related, but they're not yet in crypto. So people that um, are traders 
in, in the market or people that have a good financial understanding or people that are really into peer to peer networks, but not into blockchain yet. And there's surprisingly a lot of people like that, like people that are into Tor and whatnot, but they haven't really gotten into crypto yet. So a lot of the stuff I write is it's not conscious, but a lot of it, I, I mean it for people that already know something about money and already know something about technology. And they're like the next concentric circle to adopt crypto. And I've actually had a lot of these people reach out to me. Like my first blog post is I've seen the stats on Medium and it's mostly read by uh, software engineers who who aren't in crypto. So um, I, I, I so because I've been paying attention to to who's reading this stuff and who who reaches out to me. And a lot of the people are people that aren't in blockchain, like I said, but they do something kind of similar and they're like, they're the people that are like the next adopters as I see it. So, so I, yeah, so I, I haven't thought about presenting my ideas to people that really have no, no background in any of this stuff. I think about people that are like very close to being interested in blockchain sort of trying to explain it to them. So either um, people that come from a computer background or a finance background, but aren't yet in crypto. And that's, that's usually the kind of audience I have in my head. That's what I want to say. Perfect. Thanks for all of the answers. Um, I'm going to be having like one last question before we finish this off today. And um, that one goes to Burak, I suppose. Uh, could you please talk about the development of Chain API and how that has been going? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can. Um, so it is, it is going pretty well. Essentially, it's what I would summar summarize it as. But I think one of the things, like more like an update that I can give about it is we initially broke down the project into four. So for example, on the trailer board, you can see that we have four undertakings and then we propose the initial undertaking as the API integration platform, which is obviously what we need first so that we integrate all these APIs at scale like very quickly and easily and have them deploy their AI nodes. And then we would have the requester interface, we would have the dashboard, the marketplace, et cetera. And then, but as we started building it, we came to the re realization that having some of those components in there as well would make it into a more complete product. And then we also started uh, building those. So um, yeah, I think in general, how it goes is like we are building, like we, made pretty good progress at the integration platform side, but we also like bit into the other parts as well and made a lot of progress in terms of determining the user flow, which is, <laughs> I'd say more than 50% of the process because chain API is essentially like a graphical interface to the air node protocol and the air node, the node. And then it is like such a novel concept in that like nobody knows how a user would be in, uh, interacting with those. So we need to invent all of those as well. And once you have that down, then it is a lot more like easy to implement actually, because then it is, it becomes traditional web development. But until then we, there, there's a lot of conceptualization to be done. And then I think we made great progress there. Um, but since these are, at a conceptual level, we're not really showcasing it yet uh, in the development updates and such, but like that definitely doesn't mean that like development isn't going on. In fact, it is going at full speed. Perfect. Um, and we still have like a couple of minutes, so I'm going to throw one last question in. Um, and uh, I guess that is also something that um, Again, Sasha or Burak, most likely Burak will pr uh, be answering. Uh, I saw that you guys also hire people on a 20-hour basis. Can I apply as a junior developer or do I need more experience? I also work with completely different uh, tech stacks. Um, yeah, in general, I think we need people with like in-depth in -depth knowledge about how AR node works, how its protocol works. Like even like not, we don't even need people to actually develop these, but rather if only you can use these very well, then you can be of a lot of help because say an API provider we are uh, 
integrating them. So you can help out with that. So, or for example, we have a use case that will use um, the data from an API provider through, through an air node, then you can help with integrating that. So in general, we, we need people with good in-depth knowledge about the solutions that we, um, that we produce. And then, yeah, I think it, it all depends on how uh, committed you would be to this. But if you are uh, like ready to be committed to it for long term, we we would like we are definitely uh, hiring more junior developers uh, with the expectation that they will hang around and uh, like end up being very knowledgeable about API three solutions, and by then they will be invaluable to the DAO itself. Perfect. Thank you for that. So uh, with that, uh, our time is pretty much up. I want to thank everybody that uh, joined us today, especially Burak, Mark, Mason, and Sasha, and everybody in the audience. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning, this was our first trial uh, video AMA run, and uh, we're going to have like an internal feedback session. We're going to be waiting for your feedback, how you thought this went. And uh, we're going to have our biweekly calls on Thursdays. Um, and if this was all right, we're going to be moving forward and having these uh, video AMAs over Twitter and possibly YouTube in the future. And with that being said, we are going to be signing off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Uger. And thank you, audience. Thank you. See you next time, hopefully. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye.